Welcome back to the channel. I want to talk about a new paper that I published this week with my colleague Ben Knudsen, who's a medical student at George Washington University. It's published in the European Journal of Clinical Investigation, and it's an incredibly important paper that you need to be aware of. It's entitled COVID-19 Vaccine-Induced Myocarditis in Young Males, a Systematic Review. And it's indeed just that, an overview of all of the analyses that try to document the rate of vaccine-induced myocarditis in young men. And what is the purpose of our examination? We do something that no group has done to date. We look systematically at all of the reports of vaccine-induced myocarditis, and we ask, how often do people stratify? What do I mean by that? When you look at vaccine-induced myocarditis, you could just look at the whole population, everyone who got vaccines, but you'd be lumping together 20-year-old college men with 87-year-old women. You would lump them all together and you'll get a rate of vaccine-induced myocarditis. And if you see that rate, you might say, well, you know what? The virus is way worse than that. So no matter what, we must press on with our vaccination campaign. But that would be a very silly way to do it because a 20-year-old man and an 87-year-old woman are very different. They may have different rates of benefit of COVID-19 vaccination. Of course, it's going to be a lot higher in the older person and different rates of myocarditis. And in fact, what we know is that myocarditis disproportionately affects men in a certain peak demographic. The absolute peak is like 16 to 22. 12 to 16, it's on the way up. And then 22 to 40, it's still higher. I mean, 22 to 28 is higher than 28 to 40, but that's the peak demographic. And what you want to do in your analysis is be able to precisely say the risk and benefit to somebody based on their age and their sex. But there's more than that because there's a difference between Pfizer and Moderna. So you wanna be able to say that Moderna might have a higher rate and there's more than that because there's a difference between dose one and dose two. And we call these four things, age, sex, pro the manufacturer, and the dose, four stratifiers. And some analyses are wise enough to break it out by all those four stratifiers and others break it out by three. They lump together Pfizer, Moderna, for instance, and others just use two and some use one or none at all. And this is what you see on the slide right now. You see that the highest incidence of myocarditis occurs in studies that break it out by more stratifiers. In other words, when you actually tell me about 16-year-old men separate from 87-year-old women, it looks a lot worse. Vaccine-induced myocarditis in 16-year-old men, particularly mRNA vaccination, particularly dose two, and particularly Moderna. And this is a way people have been hiding and obscuring a very necessary dialogue, which is that our vaccine policies don't have to be the same for 16-year-old man and 87-year-old woman. It's very likely the case in 87-year-old woman. First of all, they certainly benefit from the first two doses in January 2021, and they may benefit from more doses than a 16-year-old boy. A 16-year-old boy derives the bulk of reduction in hospitalization from the first dose. The second dose is the highest risk dose. After one dose of mRNA vaccination, a 16-year-old boy is going to get COVID no matter what. They can get a second dose and then get COVID, or they can just go ahead and get COVID. Which one of those two pathways has a higher cumulative adverse event portfolio? And that's the question that we never really answered, in part because many analyses lump everyone together to hide illegitimate safety signals. So I show you right here on the screen, when we look systematically at all this, we find that just about a quarter of people are breaking it out by age, sex, manufacturer, and dose. And that's too low. I mean, this is just elementary, elementary stratifying variables. I mean, it should be 100%. Why is it only 28%? We find 45% of analyses are lumping lots of people together, and that's no good at all. This is an analysis from the UK study. It showed something that people had a trouble admitting. There's a whole group of people who are self-professed misinformation fighters. As far as I can tell, their only qualification to be fighting misinformation is that they were unable to secure a faculty position. And so, you know, if you're unable to do science, then maybe you go make YouTube videos about science. I don't know. It appears to me that that's the unifying trait. Well, the other unifying trait is they're not very good at data analysis. They were saying things like, under all circumstances, the risk of the virus exceeds myocarditis post-vaccination, the risk of myocarditis post virus is always higher. But in a paper from the UK group by Patron and colleagues, we see clearly on the screen, dose two Moderna at the 28 day mark had a much higher rate of myocarditis than infection with SARS-CoV-2, which is the red bar. That bluish purple bar is higher than the red bar. You 
you, you could even be asleep and recognize that fact. And actually the red bar is exaggerated. You know why? Because in the denominator of the red bar, they're looking at documented cases in the healthcare system of COVID-19 and asking what fraction of those people have myocarditis. But of course, there are many people who had COVID-19 and didn't have it documented. And so the right denominator would have been a zero prevalence denominator, which this study doesn't actually use. And to my knowledge, no study has actually done it properly, be that as it may. This is not to pick fault vaccine versus virus. It's really to say for this high risk demographic group, 18, 19, 20, could we have done something differently? Here are a few things we could have done. We could have just given them one dose and said, that's good enough. We could have delayed dose two by several months. That's what many other wise countries did. And what we did one year too late, we could have done a lot sooner. We could have made Pfizer and Moderna do randomized control trials of lower doses. Do you really need 30 micrograms and 100 micrograms? Or can a 16 year old boy maybe get away with 20 and you still get most of the efficacy? We could have banned Moderna and prioritized Pfizer and we would have had a lower rate of myocarditis. There are lots of things you can do between nothing and unlimited vaccine doses and the same policies in an 87 year old that might make more sense. And guess what? Medicine has always customized our recommendation for the person in front of you. We don't prescribe statins to 20 year old college kids the way we prescribe them to 87 year old women. We have different policies because we take into account age, blood pressure, other risk factors. And for COVID-19, those risk factors are, if anything, more important because the log gradient of risk is so much more dramatic for an older person. But here we take into account none of these factors in our one size fits all policy set by the CDC. Sometimes I get pessimistic. I think the only reason smart people would have a one size fits all policy is it benefits the manufacturer because they can sell more doses of their product. But that would be such a silly reason because credibility in public health is much more important than the meager short term market share of a company like Pfizer. But I can't understand it. I don't know why they're so bad at their job that they can't understand that boosters in young people might have a different risk benefit calculation than in older people. And they literally had it told to them by Marion Gruber and Phil Krauss, the two FDA officials who resigned over that very issue. So they're so dense that even when the people who've done it for decades are telling you, I will resign over this issue, they still don't understand. I find that very hard to wrap my head around. This is what internet experts, Eric Topol is a cardiologist. He frequently comments on COVID-19 policy and he is a person who actually had a news article that claims he delayed the initial approval of the vaccines. You can read my piece that's on a preprint server. It's coming soon about COVID-19 vaccines and regulatory history. Here he cites an Annals of Internal Medicine paper and look what he's citing. The overall incidence of mRNA vaccine-induced myocarditis after the first dose was one in 200,000 and one in 30,000 after the second dose in ages five to 39. But five to 39, that's a ridiculous way to lump people. You can't tell the difference between a six-year-old boy and a 26-year-old college student. We know mRNA-induced myocarditis is not a prepubescent phenomenon. Like myocarditis, it generally occurs post-pubescence. We know the highest risk group is 16 to 22. 18 to 22 is the peak incidence. Why are you adding in a seven-year-old? And why are you adding in a 39-year-old? And as someone on the upper end of that spectrum, I can say, I know the difference between being 39 and being 20. And there's a big difference, okay? So this is a misleading statistic. And then he writes, the benefits of mRNA vaccination greatly outweigh the risk. That's not the question. The question is, could you have vaccinated some subgroups more carefully, more prudently, and with a better acknowledgement of the risk benefit profile? He elides the actual question that matters. And he is presenting it in a very misleading way, which the paper did too. This is no good. This is what happens when you're not really thinking critically about the question. And you don't have to think that hard to realize there's a difference. This is from our paper. We've just published this. This is what happens when you look at multiple stratifiers and when you start to lump things together. And I think you can see clearly there's a relationship. The more you break it out in that high risk demographic group, you have higher rates of myocarditis. And we have a number of statistical tests that prove more stratifiers, more accurate rates of myocarditis. The other thing is some of the numbers on the right, they actually do two things, two disservices. One, they underestimate the risk of myocarditis in young men, which is terrible, leads to bad policy. It also overestimates the risk in an 80-year-old woman because they're getting lumped in with young men. So it actually, it fails both groups of people, ironically. This is it, just looking at the Pfizer vaccination. This is the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine right here and all the different analyses. And this is it looking at the Moderna vaccine. And Moderna, of course, in the key high-risk demographic group, it is very concerning safety signal, very concerning safety signal. Finally, 
I guess that wraps up my slides. My overall thoughts on this. We have two groups of zealots in this country. We have anti-vax zealots. They've been around for quite some time. Uh, they say many irrational things about vaccines. They paint with a broad brush. Problems with a, a single vaccine and a single demographic apply to all vaccines and all demographics. So that's, you know, an inaccurate and anti-science view. I mean, I think that's a problematic view. We also have an anti-vaccine anti group. These people have empowered themselves as misinformation fighters. They're just equally irrational. They don't understand statistics. They don't understand the nuances of that there might be some differences between 20-year-old men and 80-year-old women, and they just want to paint with a broad brush. They want to say, under all circumstances, myocarditis post-virus is worse than myocarditis post-vaccine. That's false. It's false under some circumstances. Moderna dose 2, definitely higher. It's also false because you're not doing a good faith effort to actually measure myocarditis post-infection because you're not using a denominator of all the people who were infected. You're using a denominator of all the people who sought medical care, and that's very different. With vaccines, we use the right denominator because we know how many shots we gave and you need to use a comparable denominator. This is not rocket science. This is just, if you sat down and thought about it for more than a minute, and if you thought about it without a partisan hat on, and I think that's a key point here. Many people in this space are nakedly partisan. They are mixing their vaccine policy, their five to 39 year old subgroups with open endorsement of Biden and campaigning against Trump. And in the case of Dr. Topol, I think he's acknowledged that that was one of his major concerns. So how am I to judge someone who is constantly mixing medicine, public health, and naked partisan politics? I don't view such a person as an impartial medical actor. And I have my own partisan views, but I don't mix the two. I never endorse candidates online because I know the science is something beyond partisanship. Science lasts forever and partisanship comes and goes and parties and allegiances come and go. Science is more important, but science has been perverted. And the, and the people who always say, both groups always say, they're the ones politicizing. Well, guess what? It is a problem on both ends of the political spectrum. Both groups are politicizing. In this case, this administration ignored repeated warnings about myocarditis. We have Rochelle Walensky saying that she's looked at hundreds of millions of cases and have not documented myocarditis. That seems to me a bit dishonest when she said it. I can't believe that that was true because the EMA and the Israelis had already acknowledged the signal. We have a one-size-fits-all booster policy in this country that was rammed down our throats even when Mary and Gruber and Phil Krauss resigned. That to me is problematic. They're not acknowledging that maybe we need a different booster policy in young men. Maybe we need to spread dose two. Maybe we need to try lower doses. Three, they asked Pfizer to do a post-marketing study of subclinical myocarditis. Those results were due December 31st, 2022. Those results are still not yet public. Those results must be made public. And also the FDA gave them until 2022. We could have used that information in 2021. Actually, it should have been due in June, 2021 because that information was salient to an ongoing vaccine effort. You don't give them two years for that. By the way, the horse is out of the barn because pretty much anyone in that demographic age group has already decided. And a final point, we have this world where who decides that a vaccine can be mandated? And it's some mid-level bureaucrat at some liberal arts school on the East Coast. I mean, no matter what you think about vaccine mandates, why is the person making that decision a mid-level bureaucrat at a piddly random school? That makes no sense. Either we have some centralized decision making with the very best scientists thinking about it, or we have a policy where mandates are blocked en masse. We can't have a preschool in San Francisco mandating vaccines and one liberal arts school in Maine mandating vaccines. It makes no sense. They're not qualified or equipped to think about those complex calculus. And in many cases, they probably did harm. I strongly support repeal of any law that indemnifies these colleges. They should be able to be litigated. If you are a college student, you had to get a vaccine because your college mandated it so you can attend and you have myo or pericarditis, I think you should be able to litigate that college. Litigation is the only check and balance in the system. The laws that prevent the college from being litigated are unjust laws. They need to be struck down. The colleges need to be litigated. They need to lose the litigation so they learn some humility, which is that if you're running random garbage liberal arts school, you're not qualified to be creating mandates. You're not in the, you shouldn't be in the mandate business. You, I don't understand, I mean, it's beyond, beyond, I mean, what can you even say? Even people who support mandates got to think that it should be made by someone who's actually knowledgeable and smart, not a mid-level bureaucrat. Surely, even those people, I oppose them because I think they should be used very, very sparingly. And all of the preconditions to use them were not present here. One, you didn't know that the vaccine helped others. In fact, initially, 
it looked like it worked so well that I didn't need you to be vaccinated. I was already doing well. Then it was apparent that even if I was vaccinated, I can still spread it. So in both cases, you fail that test. Then there's a more complicated calculus, which is, is it worth the political squeeze for that juice? You only have so much squeeze when you're in politics. Is it worth expending it on this one thing in this culture of heavy polarization where people are going to be resentful and hold it against you? I always felt it was not worth it. And in fact, that was vindicated. And then the final point was, even when people made complex mathematical modeling, as I featured on my podcast, looking at how many people had to be vaccinated to avert one case in a group of people, those numbers were so horrific, the policy even giving all the best case estimates didn't make any sense. And so the mandate was always unjustified and it shouldn't be made by some preschool in, you know, Brooklyn. That's just crazy. So our paper is out, European Journal of Clinical Investigation. It's a very important paper. We are proving that when one looks across all the literature that a safety signal can be hidden when people do not provide adequate stratification. We explain why some Twitter accounts that repeatedly tweet garbage that the risk of myocarditis in five to 39 year olds, that's a garbage thing to say because no one's worried about a seven year old the way they're worried about a 17 year old. And if you don't understand that, you shouldn't be commenting about the issue. So this is a problem. I think our paper is an important step forward. It needs more attention. The FDA and the CDC, their job is to provide products that improve outcomes for the American people. And it's also to take very seriously safety signals and try to mitigate those safety signals while preserving efficacy when they are confronted with that. They did not do that second thing. They failed in their duty. And two honorable people did resign over it. So they were notified. They were on alert that they were failing in their duty. They failed nonetheless. I think it's one of the greatest tragedies of the pandemic. I've written a long essay, 7,000 word essays on the preprint server. I'll put the link in the video about how vaccines were both a remarkable scientific advance, but also a great misstep in healthcare policy. And I try to juxtapose those two themes in that essay. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Professor of Epidemiology, practicing doctor, published maybe 400 studies, written a couple books on this topic. So I like to talk about these sorts of things and this is my wheelhouse. So read the link, share it, share that article widely and uh, until next time.